All right, happy Easter, everyone. He is risen. He is risen indeed. My name is Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor here at the Springs Church. It's my joy and honor to del- and, and delight to welcome all of you here in person. And those of you who are joining us online, we appreciate you uh, joining us as well. And we consider you as part of our church family. But thank you to everyone uh, who is here today. And um, I'm excited because Easter is one of my favorite uh, holidays of all time, obviously, uh, just because of what it means. It, Jesus is alive, and he is victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And I, I think about over the centuries, over years and years, how followers of Jesus have gathered together to remember Right? We remember the final days of his life. We remember that triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. We remember that final meal that he shared with his disciples. And, and we remember he, he poured out his, his, his blood in, the, in that juice and that represented. And, and, the, and he gave his disciples bread, which represented his body that was broken for us. And we remember his arrest in the garden of Gethsemane, and his trial, and his conviction by the religious leaders of that day and of the Roman Empire. And we remember his beating and his nailing to the old rugged cross. And then we remember his burial in that borrowed tomb. And we remember that he laid there for three long Days, But we also remember that it didn't end there. Amen? It didn't end there because even as Jesus' followers have mourned the suffering and the death of Jesus on the cross, we've also, year after year, we've celebrated with great joy His resurrection. And that's what Easter is really all about. It's the great joy of his resurrection my friends i want to remind us today that jesus did not stay in that tomb he was raised from the dead and now he lives at the right hand of the father and he always intercedes or prays for us and so we have a risen savior today and i want to talk to you today specifically about how his love never ever fails His love never fails. Would you say that with me this morning? His love never fails. Let's begin by prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for what this day means. We thank you that Jesus, your son, is alive and well. We thank you that he is our Lord, he is our Savior, and as we look to your word this morning, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher. You would be our teacher. That you would illuminate our hearts and our minds to understand what your spirit is saying to us today. Help us leave this place encouraged. Help us leave this place strengthened with new hope and with new power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let me begin with a question. And how, uh, how many of you have ever noticed in life from, from time to time that our expectations and our realities don't always match up? You guys with me on that? There may be things that we have expected to go a certain way. There may be things that we have expected to be finished or we've expected to receive or we've expected things that that we've hoped for, but the reality has been much different. Things maybe haven't turned out the way we expected it to. I think being a parent of little kids at Easter is a really good example of this. Here's what I mean, what a parent thought that Easter, you know, okay, how many of you have ever wanted to have just a nice, friendly, beautiful Easter egg hunt, let's say, for example, after church or in the evening or whatever, in the backyard or in the park or whatever, and, you know, in your mind, man, it's going to be magical. It's going to be great. 
It's going to be all perfect. Everybody, they're going to be dressed. The kids are going to be dressed up. No wrinkles, no stains, no problems, no fighting, none of, none of the issues. Um, and it's just going to be just wonderful. Their little baskets are going to be filled with lots of candy and, and money and chocolate inside, right? It's just going to be awesome. And, the, and the, in that candy is going to mysteriously disappear after three days, right? Because maybe dad got a little hungry for some chocolate. I don't know. Um, but just like, just like Jesus from the tomb, you know, it just disappeared. And so after the, after the Easter egg hunt, we'll get all of our perfect family pictures. And it's just going to be awesome. Everybody's going to be wearing uh, matching clothes and suits and dresses, and it's just going to be awesome. So how many of you in the room know that expectations of a family egg hunt don't always match the reality of the way it turns out? The bow ties get lost. The dresses get stained. Kids are tripping over everything in the yard and the park and and. And they're drop-kicking each other to try to find the last egg with three cents worth of melted chocolate in it. I mean, it just, it just happens that way. And their baskets are overflowing because your wife and your nana just went all Willy Wonka on, the, on Easter. And there's just chocolate everywhere. The family photos end up looking like a police lineup. <clears throat> you guys know what I'm talking about. Okay. Here's my first point. Jot this down if you're taking notes with me. Expectation rarely matches reality. The licorice jelly beans seem like a really good idea until you bite into them. Lunch with a family with a family after church sounds like a really I- I- good idea until everybody shows up. <clears throat> and somebody brings up politics. Okay. Your outfit today is looking good because there were six other options that you went through before the one that you chose actually went on your body. So the the realities of life rarely live up to the expectations of life. And these are all funny, lighthearted things this Easter morning. However, the truth is that for many of us, the expectations we had for life sometimes fall short. The expectations that we have sometimes can be painfully missed in the reality that is life. I expected that my marriage was going to look a lot different. I expected that I was going to stay in remission. I expected that I was going to be able to have enough to retire I expected to have been able to meet somebody by now. I expected. You you fill in the blank. I'm convinced that many of us here may find ourselves in a place of pain and disappointment, maybe, this morning. In some ways, we may feel like life has failed us. Other people have failed us. Maybe God himself has seemingly failed us. And maybe we feel like we have failed ourselves. But if you feel that way today, let me encourage you. You're not alone. And you're not the first. Because in the New Testament book of Luke, where we're going this morning. So if you have your Bibles or your devices, go ahead and open to Luke chapter 24. We'll be there in a minute. But two individuals find themselves on that first Easter morning walking along a dusty road from the city of Jerusalem to this place called Emmaus. Three days before that morning, Jesus of Nazareth, the one who many had come to believe was the Messiah, had been crucified. And he was dead. And along with him died the expectations of a chance to live a life of freedom. For many who followed him. They never saw this ending, this story ending in the death of the one who was going to be their rescue. 
the realities of Jesus' death were extremely difficult for the disciples and the followers to bear. And so in Luke chapter 24, this is what we're going to read today. Let's go ahead and start in verse 13. And it says this, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, look at this. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Look at verse 16. This is amazing. But they were kept from recognizing him. In other words, here's a, here's a man, and, and uh, we find out a few verses later that his name was Cleopas. But we, we see this man in a second person who's never named, but many Bible scholars believe that it was Cleopas' wife. They're walking this seven-mile stretch, recounting what had taken place in Jerusalem to Jesus over the past few days. And no doubt they were wondering how this could have happened. How could this man who was intended, we expected him to be the Messiah. We expected him to to topple the Roman Empire by force. Maybe they were wondering how this story could have ended in his death. Maybe they were wondering what are we going to do now. Maybe they were wondering how their hopes had failed. And they were wondering if they would face the same fate that their Lord had just faced. And in their wondering, in this very moment, all of a sudden they are joined on this road by what should have been a familiar face. Jesus himself. Instead of being overjoyed that somehow Jesus had conquered the, the death on, on the cross, as the Bible states, it says they were kept from recognizing him. They didn't recognize the Messiah that was right in front of their face, walking with them, talking with them. And I wondered to myself, well, why could this be? And I thought, well, maybe Jesus at that point had taken on this glorified state. He was in his new body or, you know, he was Jesus, but he was Jesus 2.0. They just didn't recognize who he was at this point. Or maybe this couple had, listen, they had just experienced a traumatic loss. They had just experienced a time in their life where their expectation didn't line up with their reality. Many of you know how difficult it is to see clearly. And to think clearly in the midst of a tragic event, in the midst of grief, in the midst of failure and suffering. Nevertheless, what, what is true for Cleopas, Cleopas, how do you say his, his name, and his wife may also be true for us. And so here's, here's my next point, and it's this, if you're taking notes, life circumstances can sometimes cloud our view of Christ. This is what exactly, this is what happened to Cleopas. Maybe your life's circumstances have made you feel like you're all alone. Maybe your circumstances have, have, you've experienced failure and grief and disappointment in this life. And maybe it has made you question the very love of God towards you. However, this story suggests to us That just because we don't recognize the presence of Jesus, maybe we don't notice him, maybe we don't acknowledge that it's him, this story reminds us that even though we may not acknowledge that he's there, he's always there. And he's always walking with us through especially the hard periods of this life. And perhaps this Easter morning, you can relate to Cleopas and his wife. You've had that same 
sense of this road is long. This is a hard journey. You've been walking this road of life and the expectations you had for how things should go didn't go that way. And you felt like God has failed you. You felt like maybe others have failed you. You felt like maybe you just completely failed yourself. Maybe you felt like you've been walking alone. And maybe you felt like you've cried out to God for answers. But God seems nowhere to be found. And here's what I'm convinced of. It's possible to feel abandoned. It's possible to feel left alone while Jesus is walking with you. While he is walking with you. Our circumstances may change. Our circumstances will change. But the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, remains the same. His love never fails us. From the beginning all the way through the middle to the end. Jesus' love never fails us. Cleopas and his wife perhaps thought it was all over. That it was all finished. But actually... It was just the beginning. Look at Luke chapter 24. We'll go back to verse 17 now. Verse 17 says this. He asked them. This is Jesus talking to this couple. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you're walking along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? In other words, Cleopas was asking Jesus, Have you been living under a rock, Jesus? How can you not have heard what has been going on in Jerusalem? Verse 19. What things... Jesus asked. Cleopas says, About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But, w- but we had hoped that he was the one who is going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. Verse 22. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it was just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Let's pause right there and think about What's going on? Because I love the picture that, uh, that, uh, of Jesus that is being painted for us right here. After being dead for three days, I would have fully expected this passage to, to, to describe Jesus running up to them and saying, Just kidding, guys. I'm not dead. I am really alive. Don't be so downcast. However, the scriptures, they say these two spoke with him with their faces downcast. They were crushed. They were broken hearted. And I'm like, come on, Jesus. Tell them the truth. However, he doesn't yet. Jesus could have been like, I'm telling you for, I've been telling you for three years how this was going to happen, and you missed it. Instead, look at this. First, Jesus listened. Oh, man, I love this. 
This is so powerful and really so convicting to me. I mean, think about this. He first listened to their hurts, to their confusion, to their bewilderment. He first took the time to ask them questions. He asked them, hey, I hear you guys are talking. What are you talking about? What are you discussing? He asked them, what things have happened? Tell me, tell me about it. Tell me your thoughts. Tell me your feelings. Like, tell me what's going on with you. And don't sugarcoat it. Like, just tell me the honest truth. Listen, in light of the hard circumstances, in light of the disappointment, of the disillusionment, Jesus invites them to give voice to their despair. Jesus invites them to be honest, to be vulnerable. And I think what we see here in Jesus in this particular interaction is his patient love towards those who follow him. How many of you are grateful for the patient love that Jesus shows us? And this is the next point. And this is what has been so convicting to me because I'm not a great listener. But love listens. Love listens. Jesus listened to them. It was his love for people that held him to the cross. It was his love for people that rose him up from the grave. It was his love for them that caused him to walk alongside of them on this road to Emmaus and to hear their hearts. It was this love towards them that they would begin to understand would never fail them. It would never, ever fail them. Now, i got to be honest with you. I am not the most patient person in the world. I'm very impatient. I would describe myself as the most impatient person on the planet. Can anybody relate to being impatient? Okay. There are times when uh, my wife will want to talk about the frustrations that she has. Now, if you're a husband like me, you may want to just jump in and fix it right away. She gets eight words in, and I'm ready to interrupt and tell her how to fix the problem. Any guys with me? Okay, you're not brave enough to raise your hand. Okay. I'm ready to interrupt with, right, I hear you, and here's what you need to do about it to fix the problem. <clears throat> kind of walking slowly through this so you guys are safe, okay? All right. I'm asking, she, she would come to me and she would tell me, Brian, I don't need you to fix this, I need you to feel it. Man, this is a question, this is something that will help your marriage. This will save your marriage. <laughs> hey, babe, you want me to fix this or you want me to feel it? My goodness, this is a life-changing question. <laughs> Sometimes she doesn't want you to fix it. She just wants you to listen and to be patient and to, and to feel it, to have some compassion, to have some empathy, right? Your fixing can wait. I just want you to feel it for now. Love listens. Love listens. Jesus knows there is value in us getting it out. He knows there is value in us speaking our frustrations, speaking our, our pain, voicing our struggle. He invites us not to be afraid to tell him how we honestly feel. Guess what? He can handle it. In fact, he wants to handle it. And he invites us to share openly and honestly without holding anything back, without putting on a mask, without any of that. Tell us exactly what we're going through and how we're feeling. He invites us to tell him, what are you discussing with your friends? He invites us 
to tell him what, what things have happened. Not only do you not walk alone, my friends, this morning, but maybe some of you here need to be reminded that you have a Savior who wants you to open up and to be honest and to be vulnerable, to speak your pain, to speak your frustration, to speak your disappointment with how reality has not matched the expectations. It's okay. And Jesus wants you to do that. He's not intimidated by this. In fact, he welcomes it. This is the heart of our Savior. After first listening, everybody hear that? After first listening, now he's going to speak some truth. Let's go back to Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he listened first, and now he's given them this truth. And the truth is essentially he's asking this, do you not understand? Do you not understand what has been transpiring in your midst? Do you not understand that this had to happen? Do you not understand that the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, had to go through this suffering? You see, Jesus realizes as he walks along with them and as he converses with them, that they had interpreted the scriptures, the Old Testament, all the prophets. They had, they had interpreted all of that incorrectly because they, they had mistakenly thought that to redeem Israel meant that finally those who had power were going to lose power and that power would be given to themselves and that redemption belong to them that way but but they were seeing this all wrong and Jesus opens the scriptures to them he teaches them about himself through the old testament and he explains once again the story of God from Moses to the prophets and all the things that were said about him in the scriptures as i was studying this i found a quote a passage by author uh, N.T. Wright. I put it up on the screen because I want you to see this. He said this, Like everyone else in Israel, they had been reading the Bible, the Old Testament, through the wrong end of the telescope. They had been seeing it as the long story of how God would redeem Israel from suffering. But it was instead the story of how God would redeem Israel through suffering. His suffering and his death. No wonder they were confused by the death of their Messiah. This is not how it was supposed to go. And yet this was how it was supposed to go. This is what unfailing love love looks like. Maybe some of the reasons that many of us find ourselves disappointed by God, by others, by ourselves, is because we mistakenly thought that being a Christian meant that everything in life would just go smooth. And there would be no problems and that we would avoid all the pitfalls and the trappings and the frustrations and the heartaches of life. And many people think that they can put one foot in the kingdom and another foot in the world only to find out that, hey, life and the kingdom of God, it it doesn't really work that way. And so they decided to give up their idea of Jesus and live for themselves. But what Jesus is explaining here along this dusty road from Jerusalem to Emmaus is this, the way things truly change beyond the circumstantial of what's happening right now to the eternal is not through power, but through through sacrifice. And the way of a Christian is not the way of authority and position, 
but it's through humility and love. The scriptures paint a picture of Jesus who gives everything to offer us life. And he invites us to give up everything to grab hold of this life that he offers. So this conversation that's covered seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus continues. And it goes like this, starting, in, starting back in verse 28. It says this, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and began to give it to them. I I love this. Jesus was the guest, but then the guest turned host. And he started serving them. In verse 31, this is amazing. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. Man, I would have loved to have been Cleopas right then. What just happened? Verse 32. They ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? You see, as they got closer to the village, Jesus acts as if he's going to continue, right? But they urged him to stay with him, with them. And Jesus comes inside and they begin having a meal together. And Jesus takes that bread from the table and he breaks it. And in this, in this moment, in the presence of Jesus, in intimate fellowship with Jesus, in that moment, their eyes were open and they recognized the reality of who Jesus really is. They recognized him. This leads me to this point. I want you to grasp this. This is probably the most important point of the message here today. It's this. There is power in the presence of our risen Savior. There is power in his presence. When you're in his presence, that's the time when our eyes can be opened. To the reality of who he is. And to the reality of your circumstances. And to the reality of what's really happening in your life. And you realize that you're not alone. And you've never been alone. It's in his presence. That everything can change. And so we open our hearts this Easter. And we realize That no matter what we're going through, no matter what challenges we're facing, no matter the failures, the disappointments, no matter the circumstances, we know that Jesus is right there with us. He's walking every step with us. And guess what? He's listening. He's listening for your heart. He's listening for you to share openly, honestly about what you're going through, about what you're thinking about, about your confusion and the chaos that may be going on inside of you. He's not intimidated by the truth. He welcomes it. As we spend time with Jesus in fellowship, we learn that there is great power in his presence. I mean, in his presence There is power to solve our difficulties. In His presence, He removes our confusion and our perplexities. He calms our fears. He eases our burdens. He dries our tears. He meets every need. He satisfies our deepest longings. And it all happens 
in his presence. There is strength in his presence. As many of you know, we're Ashley and I and our family, we're in a season of transition. We've got a couple more weeks here left in Las Vegas, and let me tell you, it's been hard. It's been a struggle. It's bittersweet because we love our church, we love our church family, and we also know that the leadership that is taking over our place is excellent. Eric, I said excellent. <laughs> But let me tell you, during this time of transition, it's difficult. It's hard. And there are times when I question myself. There are times when I question other people. There are times when Ashley and I are doing this. I remember the other night I had a dream. Sometimes, how many of you know God still speaks through dreams? And in this dream, I had had an old pastor friend who was in my dream. He was my pastor when I first started going to church. And in, in this dream, he came up to me. He, he grabbed me like by the face gently. And he said, Brian, the key to this season in life is finding strength in my presence. And the dream was over and I woke up. And I just remember and I had this sense that God was telling me and just reminding me, Brian, you're weak. You're limited. You're a human being. You have faults and failures just like everybody else. But the Lord was coming to me and intimately saying to me and reminding me, Brian, it's okay to be weak because in your weakness... I am strong. In your powerlessness, I am powerful. And God was reminding me that the strength to endure, the strength to get through a difficult season is only found in his presence. This is what Cleopas learned. This is what his his wife learned. There is power in the presence of our risen Savior. Amen? When we're in his presence, we can finally see the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. That he is the son of the living God. He is the risen Lord. It's not just a religion, it's reality. And we're reminded of his great love. His love that is unspeakable. Like I can't fully understand it, but I know I've experienced it and nothing can separate me from his love. I learned that his love is unending. The Bible says that he has loved us with an everlasting love. You learn that his love is unselfish. It gives and gives and gives. And it's his love that draws people to repentance. His love is unmerited. It's full of grace. We can't produce it. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. His love is unconditional. It's given to us with no strings Attached, And we realize that his love never, ever fails. And in fact, the Apostle Paul summed it up like that in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, where he says this, love never fails. Could you say that with me this morning? Love never fails. He loves you even when you don't feel lovely. He loves you when no one else seems to love you. He loves you when others may abandon you, divorce you, ignore you. God always loves you no matter what. In Psalm 36, verse 7, the psalmist says, How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Listen to me this morning. If you're in a place of pain and suffering and disappointment and confusion this morning, there is hope and strength for you in the shadow of Jesus' wings. Let him be your refuge. Let him be the one that you run to, not away from. 
What Jesus offers us all this Easter is an opportunity to get into his presence, to receive strength, to open our hearts, and to receive his love fresh like we never have before. You see, just one moment in Jesus' presence can change your life forever. One moment is better than a hundred sermons. It's better than a thousand church services. Just one moment in the presence of our risen Savior, Jesus, can change our lives. One moment in His presence is better than a hundred thousand million moments anywhere else. Just ask Cleopas and his wife. Just ask anyone who's been in the presence of Jesus. And I'll end with this statement here. The purpose of the written word, listen, is always to lead us to an experience with the living word. I want you to remember that this morning. The purpose of the Bible is not just to know knowledge, but it's to have an encounter and experience with the author of the Bible to experience the living word. So no matter what life has been like up till now, no matter what your Easter experience has been, no matter what disappointment, failures, sufferings you've experienced in your life, no matter how much you think you've failed, God's presence is here today to offer you new hope, new strength, new life. Because of all that Jesus did on the cross, the resurrection. This is what Easter is all about. Amen.